By this point, every single one of us knows great games based off of movies. The Lord of the Rings, The Incredible World of Mad Max, and how could we forget uh, the Barbie game, its graphics, its scenarios, <laughs> okay. But a more than clear example of this is the Harry Potter franchise because although the PlayStation 1 video games were really amongst one of my favorite ones of my childhood, the ones that came later and after those were simply not all that great. But I mean, since we were just a bunch of kids, we really weren't all that demanding. These types of games no longer exist. We could say that they pretty much went extinct. It was a slow, gradual decline and unless someone specifically mentions the issue, most don't even realize that these games are gone. Which begs the question, what really happened here? Who, or actually what, was in charge of eliminating all these video games and this is exactly what I want to talk about in this video. So, you know pretty much what they say by these days, get a bunch of popcorn ready, a bottle of lube, and uh, let's get this video started. Games based on movies have always been popular. The big publishers had contracts with Hollywood that forced them to release the games at the same times as the movies released. This agreement though meant that these video games that were made for the movies were really not cooking enough in the oven and were coming out just simply not finished. And you know, as we all know by now, releasing games that are not finished really isn't the best idea. Despite this, by the beginning of the 2000s, the stores were simply packed full of games of this type. It was almost impossible not to find them and players ended up buying them hoping that they would be as good as the movies they were based on. I mean, science was simple. In the same way that famous actors guaranteed asses in the movie theaters, what these video games did was guarantee sales because they were based off of movies that we already knew. Fans wanted to dive in and explore the places they saw in the movies. They wanted to interact with familiar NPCs and take on the role of the protagonists, looking to relive the adventures that they already knew. It's something almost elementary, right? However, and you know, without any kind of warnings, they disappeared. See, the joke is that although these video games were really very, very popular, they really weren't making the thing that video game developers wanted them to make. <laughs> Which was, well, you know, money, pasta, the oil that lubricates the holes of society. If a big publisher like EA wanted to finance one of these games, they had to go directly to the owners of the property and offer them a set amount of money up front. This meant exactly what you're thinking, this money that they gave them came out exactly from the budget for the video game. And this was a problem, because creating games ended up being more expensive than working on regular games made up by the people that were actually developing the games. Creating some sort of a weird vicious cycle where games receive little budget, the final game ends up being mediocre, and then the next game receives an even lower budget than the last one, creating so an even worse experience. Another thing to keep in mind is that these games weren't really all that great to begin with. If the property owners were somehow feeling chair that morning and decided to simply, I don't know, cut back a little bit on how much they were going to ask up front, this really didn't necessarily mean that the game was going to be great or even better because of the amount of time that they gave them to release these games. It just wasn't enough. You see, in a film job, usually the first thing that is completed is the script and then the film itself begins to be shot, which, you know, can take between a year and maybe some other months to complete the final production, given that the script and filming won't be done until a year later, the game developers can't really do anything until then but wait. And we have to be realistic, a year is simply not enough time to make a good quality video game. Which simply translates to the poor devils working on these games that really didn't have a chance to ever create a game as they wanted to create them. However, this really wasn't the case for everyone because, as I mentioned before, there were many, many other games that in some strange way, perhaps, I don't know, praying to Jesus or offering up a few goats to you-know-who, or I don't know, maybe dancing naked in the freaking rain, managed to do something that very few other developers managed to do. 
And that is, well, you know, create uh, great games based off of movies. I mean, who doesn't remember with more than love GoldenEye 007 of the Nintendo 64? Spider-Man 2 and its open world, the despair in alien isolation and many others. If one thinks about it, it's really hard to tell the story of a movie through a game, so the best path to take was to simply create a game based on the universe of the movie instead of simply sticking too closely to the original script. For example, the Spider-Man 2 game which had completely new missions and characters that was simply not reflected in the movie. I mean, the movie was about the growth of Peter Parker as a person and obviously that couldn't easily be translated into a video game if in that video game what we do is simply break every single bone that the enemies have in the video game, which simply didn't make really much sense regarding the movie. And that's part of the problem, introducing elements that work in a movie doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be working in a video game. Another example would be that of a 007, considered one of the most influential games of its time and one of the best that are based on movies. I mean, this game came out two years after the movie and even though it was rushed, just like, you know, pretty much any other game, the developers had more time to create something that, you know, decent as a word just doesn't really pay enough homage to. Now, and here's where things start to get interesting. Can you imagine that this game had been released in 1995? The Nintendo 64 didn't even exist at that time. I mean, shit, if you actually think about it, not even I existed at that time if you, well, specify the exact month. And it would have come out to the PlayStation 1, which would have radically changed the graphics and the gameplay of that video game. And you know, another interesting thing is that even though most of the times these video games were simply, I don't know, horse crap floating in the ocean, they always managed to sell pretty well. When movie games were popular, games Gamers weren't really on famous franchises like Rainbow Six or Call of Duty, which is the only thing that many people play these days. Instead, they would go to the stores and find gigantic wall of games. This would then create what is known as decision paralysis, which is when the brain becomes overloaded with a number of possibilities trying to come up with the best option. In these cases, the buyer will most likely purchase something familiar, and in this case, it was the video games that were based off of the movies, which is one of the main reasons of why these video games simply sold so much. These days, publishing companies have created large franchises based on games mainly like Assassin's Creed or GTA. I mean, it is really much more profitable for them to invest in their own video games that can become just as popular as the movies. I mean, what's more, Assassin's Creed was actually born because Ubisoft didn't really want to pay enough money to the owners of the rights of the Prince of Persia. What did they do? Well, they decided to simply rip their ideas off and send them packing. Which is one of the great reasons on why everyone simply loves Ubisoft. Another major change was the popularity of online gaming in the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 generation. Call of Duty was the most popular franchise during this time period. And although I really love the single player campaigns, the vast majority were only interested in the multiplayer aspect. Many didn't even play the campaign and if we get to thinking about it, most movies are based on telling a story which, you know, lends itself better to being adapted into a single player game. Game. Apart from this, Hollywood viewed games based on movies as an advertising tool rather than an interactive product in and of itself. Some directors like Peter Jackson were gamers and understood the potential of games. I mean, maybe that's why the games based on his movies like The Lord of the Rings and King Kong were so much better than the other crap that was coming out at that time. But I believe that the last stab in this type of games really was the revolution of the smartphones. Mobile gaming offered a wide variety of mediocrity for everyone who wanted to play something simple and could access these games without the need to visit a store. This in time would mark the end of the movie-based games for good, however, all was not really lost for the studios that adapted to this new environment. Some started releasing small games for mobile or Facebook whose quick production is better suited to the strict time limits, thus making these simple games also reach more casual gamers who 
who are looking for a simple experience to distract themselves for a while. I mean, the new Avatar movie came out a little while ago and it was accompanied by a game called Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. That video game hasn't really released yet, but Ubisoft released a trailer more than a year ago and told us that the game was going to be an exclusive for the next generation of consoles. And if we remember, a little while ago an Avatar game came out that was extremely addictive and advanced for its time. But it's also a game that we are probably gonna be talking about in another video.